If you would turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, and as you're turning there, um, we'll be looking at Philadelphia today. I sent the wrong notes to everybody. I was jumping ahead this week. I wanted to be in Laodicea, I guess. But you have two sets of notes in there. Save Laodicea for next week. And we'll be looking at Philadelphia today. People were coming in thinking that we're going to preach two sermons today. Amen. <laughs> I have it here. We could, uh, we could do it. Revelation chapter 3. This is a sixth church in the list of churches. And... Um, as we come to the sixth church, uh, this is a church of the open door. We find a faithful and true missionary church that follows Christ. And if I could just pick one church in all of the seven churches that I would like us to be mimicked um, uh, for, um, I would pick Philadelphia. And just like with Smyrna, there is not one word of condemnation in the entire letter to this church. Smyrna because of their persecution, and Philadelphia, because of their faithfulness. So let's jump in by reading a portion of our text, Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 7. And to the angel in the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have a little power, and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan, who says that they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you because you have kept the word of my perseverance. I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes... I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it any more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, if you're taking notes, there's a note-taking outline, again, the one for Philadelphia. I want you to see first the correspondent. All these letters have followed a similar um, pattern in terms of the outline that we've been using. And we see the correspondent here. He says in verse 7, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this. Again, as we've seen with all of these letters, the, the, this is a letter for the pastor of the congregation in Philadelphia, who is the angel here. That's the term, the messenger of the church. And if you remember, in all the letters, Christ um, gave himself a specific title. He's the one that's the correspondent here. And he gives himself those titles because in every case, his title is related to the church's particular situation. And so he tailors his title to what's going on in that church. And the description of Christ here in verse 7 is the first one, as we've talked about, that does not come out of Revelation chapter 1. Remember, in the first five letters, every initial description of Christ comes from that vision of the glorified Son that we saw back in chapter 1. This one doesn't. If you If you think back to all the churches except for Smyrna, Christ was presenting himself as coming in judgment to those churches if they didn't listen to what he had to say. And so for Philadelphia, there's no judgment because they're a true Christ-honoring church. Now notice the first characteristic of this correspondent, letter A, he's the Holy One. It says in verse 7, he says, He who is holy, who is true. Literally, Jesus is saying, He is the holy and the true. 
This is one of the titles that we see throughout Scripture that is used of God the Father. In the Old Testament, he is called the Holy One in many passages. For example, in Isaiah 40 and 25, it says, To him, to whom then will you liken me, that I would be his equal, says the Holy One. In Isaiah 43, 15, he says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Habakkuk, verse, chapter 3 and verse 3. God comes from Taman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Silah. His splendor covers the heavens and the earth full of His praise. And of course, we automatically, when we think about the holiness of God, are drawn to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. Seraphim stood above Him, each having six wings, with two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And we see this also in Revelation, um, referring to God, Revelation 4, eight, And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. We'll look at these living creatures when we get to it, but they're different than the seraphim. And if you study angelology, we have it up on our website. We talk about all these different creatures. But holiness, then, is the character of God. This means that He's absolutely sinless, absolutely unblemished. And this is the title that Christ uses to describe Himself here in this passage. And so Jesus is identifying Himself as the Holy One. And when he does that, he's saying, I am God. And as God, he's calling the church at Philadelphia to live a life of holiness. First Peter 1.15 talks about that. He says, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. So no church or individual ever becomes holy unless Christ is the center of our lives. He has to be the focus of everything that we do. Now, what's interesting is, he says in verse 8, he says, I know your deeds. Now, remember, he's the one that was standing in the middle of the churches. This is Christ standing in the middle of the church. And he's observing them with discerning eyes. But unlike the other churches, he doesn't give a rebuke to this church. He doesn't give a warning or any condemnation to this church. And so if the Holy One is commending this church, then that must mean that they have some characteristics that they are to be commended for. But in addition to being the Holy One, notice letter B, He is a true one. means that He is true in Himself. He is the author of truth. He is the revealer of truth. And he, he, this just means to be truthful, to be, to be right, to be genuine. You know, Christ is the only one that could say he's always right. Anyone who disagrees with him is wrong. Remember John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He didn't say that I give truth. He says in the passage, I am truth. Truth is a part of his nature. Christ stands alone as the one who is truth. In the same way, the church in Philadelphia was a true church. It stood for truth because Christ was the source of its life there. But there's a third characteristic. Let us see. He has full authority. He says in verse 7, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David. Now we have to ask the question, why did he put that here? What does that mean? What does it mean to talk about the, the key of David? And, and, um, when we see this, we need to realize that he's, this is a, the, the key of David symbolizes a messianic office. And by him saying this, Christ is referring here to Isaiah 22. Remember I told you, Revelation, has over 300 references from the Old Testament. It doesn't say it specifically, but John is always referring back to the Old Testament, and so is Christ here. And so he's referring to Isaiah chapter 22. Listen to it. Isaiah 22, 20. Then it will come about in that day that I will summon my servant Eliakim, 
the son of Hilkiah. And I will clothe him with your tunic and tie your sash securely about him. I will entrust him with your authority and he will become a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. I will drive him like a peg in a firm place and he will become a throne of glory to his father's house. So if we follow the flow of thought here in this passage we just read, we saw in verse 20 this man Eliakim. And as we went through the passage, he was given the key to the house of David, which really is the treasury. But if you go home and you read all of Isaiah chapter 22, you get to see the full story. You'll see that there was another servant by the name of Shebna. He was the steward before, and he was like the chief of staff, if you will, and but he was unfaithful, which is why God raises up Eliakim to replace him. And so God says of faithful Eliakim, Isaiah 22, 22, then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut, and when he shuts, no one will open. This means that he had the checkbook, if you will. He was the one who would open the door so that people could get funds from David's treasury. And, and that, and he was the one that would shut the door. Everyone had to go through him. Do you see the parallel here? Jesus claimed to have God's full administrative authority to distribute or not distribute all of God's resources. Look at verse 7 again. He said, he who is holy, who is true, who has the keys of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one's opens, says this. And so Jesus is going back to Isaiah chapter 22, and he's likening himself to this, and he's saying that he has the right to distribute all of God's resources as he sees fit, just like Eliakim had the keys to unlock the treasuries of the Davidic kingdom. And so Jesus has the key that unlocks the treasures of the earthly, the heavenly kingdom. And so he says, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one will open. You see, when he opens the door, when Jesus opens a door, no one can shut that door. And when he shuts a door, no one could open it, no matter what we try to do. Just like in John fourteen six, he says, no one comes to the Father but by him. He has the key and he is the key. And here John says, Jesus says here in this passage, I am the one who has the keys of David. I am the one who can open the treasure house and pour out on you the royal riches of heaven. I remember reading about uh, this missionary who was going overseas, and as he was getting ready to get on a ship, it was in those days when they would take ships, and um, he was, just as he was going up the gangplank, a friend who was a very wealthy friend came to him and, and said to him, and, 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 and was sending him off, and he put in his hand an, an envelope that was sealed. And he said to the missionary, this wealthy friend, take this envelope, And at any time while you are overseas, you come to the place that you have exhausted every other possibility and you don't know where else to turn and you have a need that you can't meet anywhere else, open this envelope. The missionary took the envelope and thanked him, put it in his pocket and went up the gangplank, went overseas and he stayed on the missions field for 22 years. When he came back, He came and he saw this wealthy friend and he pulled out of his pocket this envelope unopened and he gave it to his friend. He said, never once did I come to the place where I did not know where to turn or what to do. God took care of him. And I think many of us, including me, I would have opened the envelope and looked right away to see what it was and perhaps used it. But I'm so grateful that our Savior is the keeper of the keys. He's the one that has all the resources. And I believe that if we are good stewards, God will always provide the resources. We shouldn't insult God by saying, if we only had the money, we would do thus and so. God has it all. 
It's an insult to God to say that the work of God is failing because it's lacking resources. And so when some of us a few years ago were praying over that property there on Main Street in Shrewsbury, the land alone cost $4.8 million. That wasn't in vain. God could have given us that piece of property for free if he wanted to. But now UMass is putting up that surgical center there. Maybe God wants us to pray about somewhere else. He has the keys for the treasury and he opens it when he wants to. So that's the correspondent. Let's learn about the city. Number two, the city of Philadelphia. And if we go to our map, we'll see that um, its, its locations, um, Philadelphia, um, we're pinch hitting in there, so we won't put the map of it. Do you know how to put it up, Maya? There you go. Thank you. Um, as you can see from this map, um, what it was like, um, you see the island of Patmos there circled. Um, in red, and then you look over to the right and you see Philadelphia. Um, we're coming down the horseshoe now. Now, it was very close, as you could see, to, to Sardis, and, and all of the cities were just about 30 miles apart when you really um, think about it, um, going up the horseshoe and down there. But the city is called Philadelphia, and the name comes from two root words, You've seen them before, phileo, which means love, and uh, adelphos, which means brother. And it's interesting, um, the word adelphos is a, a word that means brother as from the same womb. That's the idea of the word adelphos. And the, the, the word phileo is really a brotherly love. So you put them together, it's really strong. And the city was founded by this king, Attalus II, who was the king of Pergamum. And he names it Philadelphos because of his love for his brother. Now, out of all the cities there in the seven churches, Philadelphia was the newest of all of these cities. Now, as the next slide shows, the city was actually built on a hill and on the slope of a hill. Looking over a valley it was a city with constant earthquakes because it was built in an area where there were a lot of volcanic disruption. And so the people in Philadelphia were constantly having to flee the city every time there was an earthquake and to avoid being crushed in their houses. They were also used to a lot of aftershocks. And so the ground was always moving in Philadelphia. They had to deal with that all the time. The land was uh, a very um, rich soil, rich in agriculture, and grapes were the primary crop in Philadelphia. And like Many of the cities there in the seven churches, they also worship pagan gods. In their case, one of their primary gods was the Greek god Dionysus, Dionysus, who's the god of wine. And it became the city's main god. And you could see because of their, the grapes. Um, in fact, uh, Philadelphia was nicknamed Little Athens because they worshipped some of the same gods that were found in Athens, Greece. One of those gods was named Mammon. Does that sound familiar? Um, he was the god of possessions. Remember when Jesus said you can't worship God and Mammon? Um, he was talking about possessions, but Mammon was the god of possessions. They believed that every source, the source of every possession they had, came from Mammon. Another god they worshipped was the god Aphrodite, the, the goddess of sex. Still another goddess was the goddess Sophia. Sophia stands for wisdom, and this was the goddess of learning. And so um, they were like most of the, the churches and the cities that had pagan worship. Philadelphia was also an outpost for the uh, Greek missionary activity. And when I say missionary, I'm not talking about the religious kind or the spiritual kind, but the city was used to, to as a launching point to sell the Greek culture to the whole area. It was kind of like a, an outpost, if you will, where they wanted to, to use that city to spread the Greek language from there, and they did. Because by A.D. 19, the native language was gone, and the people only spoke Greek. Now, just to give you a point in history, in A.D. 17, a powerful earthquake destroyed 12 cities in this area, including both Sardis and Philadelphia. 
And so if you think of, remember when John wrote this, it was about A.D. 95, 96. And so as John is writing to this church then, this city would have been rebuilt back, since back in A.D. 17. So they would have rebuilt this city. Today the town still exists. It's called Alice, Alice here, which means city of God. You can see in the next picture, um, a picture of the modern city. Um, of Alasir. Um, and then the next picture is one that shows some of the ruins from the ancient city. And today there still is a church in Philadelphia. And that is the city that we find this church. And so notice number three in your notes, the church. The church. Now we'll be here quick because we don't know much about the church except from this letter. Um, there's no word from Paul about it. We don't know who founded it or how it was started. I guess you could guess and say that maybe somebody came out of Ephesus. If you remember, Ephesus spread the gospel far and wide, so that's possible. Um, but we do know that Christ opened some doors to the church at Philadelphia here. And it's interesting that we don't know who founded it, but they are the church that is commended the most. They had a wide open door um, to do their work. The Church of Philadelphia was a tremendous church. There's no condemnation for this church in this letter. And so they had commendations, though. So let's look at that. Number four, the commendation. And we see in verse 8, he says, I know your deeds. This is a familiar phrase that he starts with when he's talking to all these churches, and he's reminding them, that since he is the truth, the holy one, the true one, that since he is that, he knows the truth. And so he, even though there's no condemnation, he says, I know your deeds. He knows what they really are like. And so to know that and to, to even Cosette agrees with that. And so he said, he knows that they must be commended. Now, I think if we really thought about it, some of us, would worship a little bit differently on Sundays if we knew that what that God was looking in our hearts. If we really knew it, we would serve a little bit different. Some of us may start tithing or give a little bit different if we realize that Jesus saw everything. He saw our wallets or our pocketbooks. And so it's with this omniscience and with these penetrating looks that he commends them for several things. First, we see they had great opportunity, letter A. He says in verse 8, I know your deeds. Behold, I have um, put before you an open door, which no one can shut because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. The Philadelphian church had a wide open door. They had an opportunity to be a spiritual blessing, perhaps also for evangelism. Christ had opened it up. He had the keys, the keys uh, as of David, as he said earlier. And this has been something that we've seen throughout Scripture. Paul, for example, knew this firsthand, 1 Corinthians 16, 9, for a wide door for effective service has been opened to me. He realized that. 2 Corinthians 2, 12, now when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ and when a door was opened for me in the Lord, he realized there was a door there. That's how he could go. Colossians 4, 3, praying at the, t- the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been in prison. You see, when God is going to open a door, he opens it up no matter what people may do. He opens it up, and no one is going to shut it. A few years ago, when when um, there's a small group that gathers on Sunday nights, we want it to be bigger. But when we started praying a few years ago for some specific things, and in addition to praying for our church and for our ministries and missionaries and so forth, we were praying at that time for an assistant pastor. Those of you who are here remember that. We didn't know where he would come from. We advertised it. Nothing was happening. And, um, and we, we didn't know. We, we, we just said, God, we want you to provide one. Now, why do we want one? Not because everybody else had an assistant pastor or it looks good to have an assistant pastor, but because I'd sensed an opportunity to impact our children 
and our youth and our young adults in meaningful ways. Yes, the numbers were small back then, and, and they may still remain small, but there needs to be a specific attention given to them. But I also sense that we were on the brink of growing and that we needed to have the foundation. And then we prayed for one other specific things, and that was one of the themes that kept coming up. We prayed specifically for more young adults to join our church, and I think we've seen God open the door to that in that area. And in addition to that, we've seen other age groups come as well. But here's my point in saying all of that and reminding us. I believe, and, and it, it was a tremendous uh, opportunity to go through that. And if you were here and praying for those things and actually see it happen, what a blessing it was to see that. That's why I encourage people to come back. You miss things when you miss Sunday school, when you miss our times in the evenings. But the point is, I believe God has only given us the first fruits of all that we were praying for. I believe that he still has an open door here at Grace Baptist Church. He, he's had it open for a while, and he's waiting for us to take advantage of it. This means that we have to take advantage of it in every aspect of ministry here. We have to jump in, and we have to take advantage of it before the door closes. So if you're a leader, if you're a ministry leader, or a teacher, or someone serving in ministry, we got to keep serving, we got to keep pushing forward. If you have a task to do, do it. Do it quickly. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Do it with all your heart. And if you're not serving, then talk to us about how you could be serving so we could start moving forward, because we have an open door, just like the church there in Philadelphia. But the door could close just as quickly as it opened up, And then next thing we know, the whole thing is dried up. But Jesus continues by saying, number one, under that there, that they have his power. The reason that they have an open door is because of what we see at the end of verse, verse eight there. He says, because you have a little power. Now, Christ isn't saying here that the believers are weak. That's not what he's saying here. Um, he's saying that they're small in number. That's the idea. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. This is Paul speaking, and he had asked for this thorn in the flesh, whatever it is, to be removed. And God said, No, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. The word power there is the word dunamis. You hear our word dynamite in there, dunamis. Um, and God is saying, you have a little dynamite. But God is saying here that even though it's a little, little is a lot when I'm involved here. It doesn't matter how small a group they were. He's saying, I can use you. God saying, I could use you to turn the world upside down if he wanted to. The believers may have been few in number, but they were powerful in their impact. Folks, we have a small number, but we can be powerful if we let Christ have all the control. Every single one of us, though, has to be involved. I can't imagine what it would be like if every single one of us were praying a few years ago rather than just a few of us. It would have been a completely different story. And so God is not looking for, when he talks about a little power, God is not looking for people of great ability. You've all heard this before. He's looking for people of great availability. All right? And so he wants us. And that's what I want for our church to be. Notice, secondly, they have obedience. He says in verse 8, and you have kept my word. He says, I've given you an open door because you have a little power and have kept my word. The faithful church is the true to the word of God. You know, in today's day, the Bible has become a myth for a lot of people. And um, the church at Philadelphia here, that wasn't the case. They kept the word of God. They believed that the Bible was the word of God. That's what makes a church faithful. But notice also, thirdly, they were loyal. He says in verse 8, And you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Jesus had said back in Matthew 10, 22, 
that you will be hated because of my name. And even though this was the case with the Philadelphian church, they never denied his name. Whoever it was, whatever it was that opposed them, they still stood true to Christ's name. So letter A, that's letter A, they had the opportunity, but notice letter B, they will overcome opposition. All right, this is his commendation. Verse 9, Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan, who says that they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Now, sometimes the door of opportunity becomes open and there's adversity that's there. It's open and there's, it's like you're going against the stream. Remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, 9, for a wide door for effective service has opened to me and there are many adversaries. Now, sometimes people are looking for an easy way out of situations. I know for me, right, if I need to take medication, I, I would rather take the pill. For me, a pill is easier to swallow than have to use drops or all these types of things that take too much time. But it's the quick and easy for me. But when it comes to serving God, there is no quick or easy. And as good as the church was, not everybody liked this church in Philadelphia. We see in verse 9, um, he talks about the synagogue of Satan. Remember, we saw the same language when he was talking about Smyrna, that they were, they were there in the synagogue of Satan. And here in verse 9, he's speaking of these people, verse 9, who says that they are Jews and are not, but lie. And, and these are, are, are real Jews, uh, uh, culturally, but not spiritually. Um, the one thing about them was that they claim to be of God, they claim to be of the synagogue of God, but Christ says they're really of the synagogue of Satan. They're lying. But Christ says, I'm going to make the synagogue of Satan bow at your feet, and they will know that I have loved you. And I think how this happened was at the church of Philadelphia, they lived such a changed life. They lived as such good examples in the community that these Jews eventually acknowledge that the Christians were true followers of God. Now, this may have happened in a smaller sense back at that time, but this will really happen in a greater sense when Christ returns. Now, notice letter C, they had a great promise. He says in verse 10, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. And so we see this hour of testing that's going to come on everyone. And this hour of testing that he's talking about here is the tribulation that we will see later on in Revelation, starting in chapter 6. The question is that everybody always asks is, does the church go through the tribulation? And the answer is, no, we do not. We see that here from the scripture. Look at verse 10. He says, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world. This is a tremendous promise that we won't go through the tribulation. We will be kept from that hour. We have no place, the church has no place in the tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, Jesus rescues us from the wrath to come. The tribulation in eschatology is the 70th week of Daniel. If you remember, we studied that when we studied Daniel. You can go back and, and, and listen to that. But the church wasn't part of the 69 weeks. So why would it be part of the 70th week? The church is on the earth in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, but in chapters 4 and 5, it appears in heaven. And in chapter 6, the tribulation begins on the earth. And so Jesus says, I will keep you from that hour. You can underline that word from. It doesn't say, I will keep you through the hour of testing, or I will keep you in spite of the hour of testing, or in the midst of the hour of testing. Christ says to the church, since you have been faithful, I will keep you from the hour of testing. Now, a lot of people will take 
different stances and they'll say, well, this is only for the faithful church. There will be faithful churches and faithful Christians who will be pulled out and kept from it, but the unfaithful Christians and the unfaithful churches will stay. But no, the case is God will pull all Christians out of the hour of testing. And Christians won't have to go through it because there was a reason that he has the tribulation that does not include the church. And so he says that it's this hour of testing in verse 10 to test those who dwell on the earth. This word translated testing means to uh, attest in order to demonstrate the quality of something, not to to purify its quality. This hour of testing will involve the whole world and not just a local area. It will be everywhere. It's intended to judge those who dwell on the earth. But this church, or the church, any church, won't be there. They will be raptured and will not go through the tribulation. Now notice number five in your notes, the command. He says in verse 11, after he's talked about this testing that's going to come, and he says, I'm coming quickly. Now, he will take the Christians out of the world before the tribulation comes, and once the tribulation starts, he will come back quickly. That word quickly means suddenly. It's that word we talked about before we get our word tachometer from it. It's the word tachios. It means it's, it's measured. It moves fast. It measures something that moves fast. And Christ is saying, I will come back suddenly. And all these events that will happen during the tribulation, during this hour of testing that he just talked about, will happen speedily. Then he will come. You see how verse 11, the first part is linked with verse 10. He says the testing, hour of testing that will come, will, will, will come. And then I'm coming quickly. It's going to happen fast. And because of this, he says to them in verse 11, he says, hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. You see, if you serve Christ, he rewards you with a crown. That's a promise from Christ. And so we hold fast so as not to lose our crown. Could I lose my crown? Yes, I can. Can you lose your crown? Yes, you can as well. And so we need to hold fast. We need to watch out that our lack of holding fast does not cause us to lose our crowns. Again, I'm not talking about salvation here. Salvation and crowns have nothing to do with each other. We have eternal security. Once we're saved, we're always saved. But the the world, the flesh, would like to rob us of our reward. But we can serve Christ, and we can also win a reward, or we could go back into sin, and we could lose our reward. So Christ says to the church at Philadelphia, you've got a reward already. Now hang on to it. Hold fast. Don't lose it. He's saying it's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. But hold on. And he says the same thing to us. Hold on. Hang on. Don't lose it. Then notice finally, number six, the counsel. We see in verse 12, he says, He who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. There's several promises that he makes here. Look at the first one. They will have permanence. Letter A. He says in verse 12, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. What is that all about? You see, he's writing to these people and they would have understood what he was talking about because of some things that happened culturally. Back in that time, whenever a great aristocrat or a senator or an educator or anyone who was famous or or a noble person in that time, whenever they'd done a great deed, the people of the city would memorialize him by erecting a pillar with his name carved on the pillar. And then they would put that pillar in one of the temples of their gods, so that his name would be memorialized as a constant reminder of him and the deeds that he had done. But notice the contrast of what was done in that society um, for them. This was done in the temple of one of their gods. But in the eternal temple of the true God, 
Every one of God's children, as Jesus is saying here, will be like a pillar. We will be memorialized for all of eternity because we belong to Jesus Christ. That's exciting stuff. You know, a pillar would be stability, would be permanence, would be immovability. And so Jesus is saying to the church in Philadelphia, you think you have no uh, status, but I'm going to give you an eternal place of honor. Their names, the church there, their names weren't in any temples because they weren't noble or, or those famous people. But God's saying, I'm going to give you an eternal place of permanence. Then notice also, letter B, they will have stability. He says in, in verse 12 again, and not only will it be in the temple of, of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. This was significant um, for the people when they saw this statement. Uh, if you remember, I told you about Philadelphia had a lot of earthquakes. And so the people kept spending their time leaving the city and coming back, rebuilding, leaving, coming back. They kept doing that. There wasn't stability. There wasn't any kind of permanence. Soon as an earthquake would start, they would run out and they'd stop. They would come back and so forth. But Jesus is saying here, when you are with me, you won't have to go out anymore. And so they understood that message. They lived in constant insecurity and fear. But Jesus says here that you are secure. There's no more need to fear when you go into my house and my city. You don't have to go out anymore. It's going to be a city that's unshakable. It's going to be permanent, immovable, eternal, stable. But notice also, let us see, they will have notability. They have notability because Christ says that he will write three things on the overcomer in verse uh, 12 there. The first thing that he's going to write, number one, God's name will be written on them. He says in verse 12, he says, and I will write on him the name of my God. Now, why would he do that? Again, he's giving them language that they would relate to. Because back in that time, when someone had a slave, they would often brand them this with the name of the owner. This would mean that somebody else couldn't touch them. They belonged to someone else. And God is going to say to us, he is mine. And his name will be written on us that we belong to him. I'm not making the case that God's going to brand us. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, just like a brand is permanent, God is claiming us. We will also be permanent. You see, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, it's eternal. And we are an overcomer. And if you are an overcomer, like he says here in the beginning of verse 12, you have God's name written on you, and no one can touch you because you belong to him. Christ says that. He will also write on the overcomer something else. Number two, the home city will be written on them. He says in verse 12, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. Where is your citizenship? It's not in the U.S. or whatever country. It's in heaven. But as the verse says here, the capital city of heaven, and we'll look at that when we get to the end of the book, is the new Jerusalem. And Christ wants to make sure that everyone knows where you belong. He's telling us, and he's telling them, and by extension us, you're just a pilgrim in this world, but you belong in the new Jerusalem. And then at the end of the verse, we see Christ says, number three, they will have Christ's name written on them. They have God's name written on them. We will. We'll have the name of the city written on us, and we will have Christ's name written on us. Look at the end of verse 12. He says, and my new name. Now, in the New Testament, we know Jesus, we know his name as Jesus. In the Old Testament, they would use the term Yeshua. But in heaven, a new name for Christ will be revealed to us. Perhaps it's Conway, I don't know. No, we don't, we don't know. No, no, no. But can you imagine having the name of Jesus written on us? And having that same name, whatever that new name is, that's going to be revealed. I don't know what his new name is, but it is also referred to in Revelation 19.12, where he says, His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. 
and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. That confirms to me that as an overcomer by faith in Christ, I'm in union with him. I am one with him. It's like when a bride takes her husband's name. It's the same manner. Christ is the bridegroom, and we are the bride as the church, and we will have his name. But notice what Jesus says as he closes this letter. Look at verse 13. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, we've looked at this before, and he's saying those who have an ear, let him hear. That word hear has to do with obedience. And so he's saying, he who has an ear, let him obey what the Spirit says to the churches. The appeal then from Christ is for all of us to listen to what he has to say. This goes for believers and unbelievers. He's saying, if we have ears, we should listen to what he has to say. And the question is, do we have ears this morning? What a great church this is as we've looked at it. So let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would help us to strive to be like this church in Philadelphia. Lord, help us to look at what is said about them here in this passage. And as individuals, that we would strive to be the same way. And we know that if as individuals we strive to do that, then as a church, we will have the same commendation. Lord God, test our hearts. Try our hearts. And find us faithful. Help us to Remember to only trust in you. And help us to respond as the Holy Spirit leads. In Christ's name, amen.